I'm uh, Rashad Sinim. I'm a visual artist. I do uh, sculpture and, and graphic arts as, a, as you know, professionally as a training. But uh, I also have uh, certain circumstances that I've developed my interest in, in uh, heritage and in cultural heritage. Uh, I was uh, brought up in an in a artistic family uh, who contributed quite a lot to artists and the art movement, modern art movement in Iraq. And uh, my father was also a diplomat, so I was brought up in many different countries. And uh, particularly what, what maybe uh, influenced myself as, as, a, as a, my interest was a period in Sweden where I lived uh, uh, close to the water and we saw a lot of, of um, people using the boats and on the rivers, set on the lakes over here. Uh, and during that period as well, I used to hear about um, Tor Haida, who uh, had made the Kontik expedition, the Ra expedition later on. And uh, we used to make models of it in, in school, etc. So these sort of things were in my mind. And as a young man of, of uh, 20, I had the opportunity of, of engaging um, with Tor Harda as a crew member and also building the Tigris uh, reed boat, which we traveled from, um, from Iraq. At the, we built it at the meeting place of the Tigris and the Euphrates River uh, in Gurna and took it down the Shat al-Arab and through the, through the Gulf uh, to uh, uh, Pakistan and then across the Arabian Sea to Africa. This is a reed boat. 18 meters by 6 meters, proving that you know, cultures used to be able to travel between each other and, and connect with each other, and that there was trade from earliest times. So, I mean, these sort of were form, you know, uh, they, they formulated my, my, um, my perceptions, and uh, I then had the opportunity of traveling around uh, quite a few countries afterwards, after uh, I left Iraq in, in 1982. Uh, and lived in Morocco and in Yemen, places where there's still a very strong uh, uh, cultural heritage, traditional culture, crafts, etc., all of these things. So um, uh, I was always interested as an artist in you know, what is art? Is, is what we think about as, uh, as modern art, is it a, uh, something that is universal or is it specifically European, because if you go to countries like Yemen, um, who are until now are very traditional, you find that the art that you see is an art that is a lived art. The house is part of that art that you live, the clothes that you wear, the things that you use, all of that. But there isn't any piece of art that you carry and put it on the wall and say that is art and the rest isn't, or a sculpture or that sort of thing. And that, this, this idea of art has, has always been on my mind, that art is part of life and what you live and what you see and how you engage with the environment and all of that. Not something that's quite separate. Um, of course, that's very difficult to do as, as an artist in this age and time because we have this very clear idea of what art is you know, uh, as something that you own or that's different or special, etc. Um, so, as an, as an Iraqi, because I'm I'm Iraqi, my mother is German, but I feel very Iraqi. Um, I, I uh, had the opportunity to go back to, to Iraq in, in 2013, uh, building boats. So I, I, I suggested a trip on the Tigris River from as far up uh, on the Tigris as possible down south, and uh, an NGO called uh, Nature Iraq. Uh, they, they went through with, with this project and built uh, a number of boats, uh, canoes, um, called Meshouf. And I joined them and I also built uh, uh, boats because I've always been interested in boats, like I said. And uh, we, we, I built a, a, a round boat called uh, a Gufwa, which is like a coracle, and uh, uh, also a, a kelek, which is a, like a rog, log raft that floats on, on skins. And we went down from, um, um, uh, from Hassan Kiev in Turkey, southeastern Turkey, uh, in stages to the south of Iraq. 
But what, what really struck me, this is 2013, was how little there was engagement with, with the rivers and with, with the landscape and how seriously affected the, the, the cultural heritage was not just in the built, but the, the crafts. And that, that uh, really impacted me that I needed to do something, to engage something with, with this and how to do that as an artist. Uh, so in, in, um, in 2015, um, I, uh, I made an exhibition with the idea of uh, Noah's Ark. Uh, why Noah's Ark and why, why, what this idea was is, is important for me now because it's the, the conceptual basis of, of all the work that I'm doing at the moment. And uh, uh, this round boat that... Uh, I built in um, for this trip down on the Tigris in 2013 um, is, is the core, literally, of this idea about Noah's Ark. And everybody knows Noah's Ark as a, a wooden ship. You know, it's uh, it's very well known in, in Europe. You have children's toys of Noah's Ark, and you've got films. You know, Russell Crowe and, and all sorts of people doing Noah's Ark. Uh, but in actual, it has nothing to do with the origin of the story, which is in Mesopotamia, uh, through the, you know, it arrived in, in Europe through the Bible, you know, but that came from the Torah, and it came originally from the Babylonian, from the Babylonian, from the Akkadian, and going all the way back to the Sumerian, um, where it's first mentioned around 3000 BC in, in Gilgamesh and other stories of the flood and Noah's Ark. So there's a sort of a Chinese whispers of this story. One culture taking it to the next one and each culture changing it. So in Europe you have a, the idea of the Ark as a, as a wooden boat, basically a 17th century boat, nothing to do with the time or the culture or the environment where it came from. Um, so even the original story uh, that uh, was first written down was written down many thousands of years after the event. So. Something did happen. There was a flood, and we know scientifically that there was a, fl uh, a flood, and uh, people must have escaped from it. Uh, so, uh, what I what I thought was, how could the boat, if there was a boat, I'm not interested in proving anything about Noah, about what kind of boat, etc. It's not the point of, of what I'm doing. What I'm interested in is, is is how to do something that will will focus on what I consider. A, a sort of an, an, an essential alphabet of making, an ABC of making, that we can say is universal all over the world. And by the way, the, the flood story is also universal. There are 350 flood stories around the world, all over the world. The biblical one or the Mesopotamian one is not the only flood story. I mean, the Aborigines of, of Australia have an oral tradition of, of a flood and there are people who arrived there now 65,000 years before um, our, our time. So uh, we know that, that human beings have used boats, and we know that there have been floods all over the place, but for how, how would, uh, would human beings have, have uh, made boats or big enough to escape a flood? And this would be done by, by the material of a place and the time of its making. Uh, and what I'd noticed in my traveling and also what I saw in, in Iraq was that the, the, the basic sort of language of making, because of the wars that we've had, because of the, the changing consumer patterns, uh, we have lost a lot of essential crafts. And also struck me that, that though Iraq now has developed quite a, um, quite a successful and quite a wide-ranging art movement, so we have artists all over the place, we have many artists inside the country, we didn't have a parallel, a parallel development of the crafts. And uh, for me, the crafts, handicrafts, is, uh, is the, the link between the environment you know, and society. It's the, it also creates the, 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 uh, the intelligence or the imagination that enters into designing, into it's how you think. 
and every uh, you know all all these all the cultures around the world have crafts that are based on their particular environments. So you have, like in Southeast Asia, a bamboo, a bamboo culture. Uh, in, in, in Japan, Japan wouldn't, be, wouldn't have its uh, industrial revolution and its design without a, a, a cultural base of crafts that has origami, that has the work with, with wood, it's very specific wood, makes things small, etc. So it's a mindset. Uh, Sweden, Finland, Scandinavia, you know, have a, have a particular design attitude that has to do with, you know, the, the, the woodworking that they have, the use of stone that they have, the kind of a sense of purity. So it crafts and, and, and the, 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 the cultural heritage, and a lot of it is intangible, is, is part of the mind of, of the people. And what we found in, in what I found in Iraq that this this mind or this this, this uh, uh, alphabet of making has been hurt seriously hurt because of the wars because of of uh, quite a few different uh, reasons, and one of them, sadly, has been because of the success of a certain attitude towards art, you know, as art being you know the star artist, the gallery, the exhibition, the the monument, you know. Uh, while art is a very wide field of activity, and if, uh, we have, we've got quite a narrow view of what art is. So, going back to the um, to uh, Noah's Ark. So my my uh, uh, hypothesis or my my idea was how would an ark have been made uh, at its time of place, which would be sort of between 24 and 8,000 BC, before the Bronze Age. So you don't have any metals. So it means all the material would have been from around you. Uh, and we know that certain kinds of boats existed from earliest period. So this round boat, the, the guffa, which is a coracle in English, we know that it existed from the earliest of times. These are elementary, the, the, the raft, the canoe, uh, the bundle boat, like the Tigris that, uh, expedition boat that I went in, which is a bundle. And a bundle is part of that ABC of making. So if you, um, if, uh, if you want to make um, something strong, you can gather many of the same thing and tie it together, and you get a bundle. That's you know, like uh, the rope for me is maybe A, you know? To make a rope, nobody invented a rope. You know, ropes were is in nature, it's in here, it's, it's all around you. It's a concept that's around. Uh, so also the bundle. Um, so what I, what I came forth with was if uh, you had these materials and, and you were building a boat, you wouldn't build something that you'd never built before and put all you have on it. Uh, so it wouldn't be a structure that is unique as, as one entity but rather a gathering of many things. So the idea was that you know, you'd be gathering, you'd be gathering all you have into, into an entity that you'd try to protect from the flood. Now the thing about the round boats is that if you, if you bring those round boats together, it creates a certain pattern. And the pattern is, is um, in geometry or, or in um, in sacred geometry, it's called the, the, the flower of life, which is uh, one round and with six around it. So you have a hexagonal pattern. And if you have a bundle and you make a cross section, any bundle of anything is, is that pattern. Uh, bees gather their, their cells in that pattern. Uh, a lot of plants, like the palm tree, the, uh, the, the fronds, they grow, they grow in that way. It's something that you see around you everywhere, this thing that, you know, gather anything of the same diameter and it will make this pattern. So I put that in the center of the boat. So if you have many, many of these guffas, coracles, gather them together, you get this, this shape. And then you can put in other boats like petals of a flower, you know, and you can fill the space between them with the, the platforms. Um, uh, of uh, rafts, uh, and then create a structure on top of it that is also organic. I'm sorry, that's also organic. 
uh, and this uh, the, the the story that we have of of the ark and Noah and this it comes from the south of of Iraq and the 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 Gulf what we call the Gulf uh, the, the Arabian or the Persian Gulf up to you then uh, used to be a continuation of what we know as Mesopotamia now and we have uh, evidences of the rivers extending all the way to to uh, uh, the Gulf of Oman and the, uh, the Straits of Hormoz. Uh, and the kind of landscape over there would be like you have in the south of Iraq at the best of times, which is marshlands with islands and stuff. Yeah. So the, they, they don't have uh, wood that you can make into lumber, timber. It's all reeds. Mm -hmm. yeah, so, and they have a, a, a particular way of making their uh, buildings is a bit like Lake Titicaca in Bolivia, you know, where they have only reeds as well. Same kind of, of boats, same kind of huts, uh, basically bundle constructions. So the superstructure of the, the uh, ark would be bundle constructions and, and matting and tarring. And you have tarring, uh, tar naturally in, in, in Iraq, you can use that. And this is described from the earliest times, earliest stories about uh, the ark. So, um, <laughs> so the idea was to, um, to do this as an, as an art project, but then I decided to actually uh, recreate it boats and see what's happening in Iraq, and went back to Iraq in two, from 2016. The exhibition was in, in 2015 with uh, uh, Edge of Arabia, friends of mine, who uh, gave me the space to make this exhibition and I, I managed to sell some works and I used that to go to Iraq to start to make these boats. Uh, and I found the last people who, who uh, make the round boat was an old woman uh, because they haven't been making these boats. Uh, the last one of these round ones was in 2003 and they're only making them for fishermen um, because before they used to make the, um, these small boats that, these fishermen's boats are like one meter fifty. They used to make these up until the 1950s, maybe even early 60s, but 1950s, up to six meters in diameter. Yeah. Cargo, mm -hmm. so round cargo boats, uh, taking watermelons and bricks, etc., down, down the river. Um, yeah, so... Um, I started recreating those boats um, in uh, Babylon and making workshops in Babylon, uh, exploring different techniques of building and making of these boats. Uh, and that took me to the next stage, which was to build the other boats, the other type of boats that I know are traditional. Now, all the boats, traditional boats in Iraq, by the, by the late 70s disappeared. And in their place, we have uh, fiberglass boats, metal boats. Only very practical, nothing to do with heritage. You know, they're not, mm. they're, the form might be like you have round metal boats and you have canoe-shaped boats that are fiberglass and, 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 and metal. But there is this disconnect with the material, original material. Mm. Um, so, um, and there also was a, was a loss of... Um, Aesthetic, an aesthetic thing, uh, and I'm, I'm more and more. I think that there is a connection, not only in the design imagination, but in the aesthetic imagination between the environment, the ecology, and uh, uh, crafts. Uh, how, how you engage with it. So, you see, for example, in in the boats. Uh, one of the type of boats that I work with and I've returned is called a, a, a mishouf tarade, which is a, um, a canoe, but with a, with a prow that is very high and curved and beautiful. It looks a little bit like the Viking boats, mm -hmm. but uh, pointed. Uh, and you see this sort of curvature here, and you see the curvature as well in, in the houses. Uh, and uh, in Iraq, I think there was a f one of the oldest uh, brick arches. 
So you have got this sort of curve, and I think even in the in the imagination with people, you know, Islamic country, Middle East, it's this curvature, and I think there's something, there's a resonance uh, uh, with the palm tree, and the material of the palm tree, and the parabolics of the palm tree. It's not a matter just of of the crescent, you know, but of of what you have in the environment around you. So uh, uh, anyway, to cut a short, uh, a very long story. Shorter. You know, um, I've, I've been working uh, systematically to return boats, and now I've returned the making of the round guffos. I've returned different types of of canoes in the south, and uh, lately I went to Ambar, uh, which is a uh, uh, province in eastern, uh, sorry, in western western Iraq, on the Euphrates, in a place called Heat. Uh, and that has just been liberated from ISIS, this area. So uh, it's gone through quite heavy sort of uh, time, a lot of destruction in the area. But heat, this is western, western Iraq, Mount Euphrates. Um, heat was a source, has a natural, a natural source of tar. Yeah. And over here in Stockholm, I noticed uh, actually, you know, the, the roofs over here, a lot of them are copper, mm. yeah. because yeah, Sweden was for a, a, a source of copper. Mm. Copper is, is one of your things. Well, in Iraq, we have tar, mm. and uh, roofs are roofed with tar. Even the ziggurat, you know, the ziggurat of, of Ur, for example, the, the step pyramids, between every platform is tar, mm. you know, and, and mats, and it keeps the whole thing together. And all the boats that are done are, are tarred. Mm. The Sumerian boats were called the black boats because they were all tarred. You know? And uh, uh, even as early you know, as you know, the beginning of, of agriculture, uh, the, the sickles used for harvesting before metal were flint stones that were held in place in, in ceramic uh, sickles with bitumen. So there's this natural material. Mm. Um, we found the, la the only remains we have found, uh, because this is uh, organic material, you know, the, this, the problem with, with, with organic technology is that you don't have very much remains. That's why we call it intangibles. It's part of the intangible. Of course, the main intangible is the spoken word. And, and things that song and, and dance, uh, tattoos that you, know, you cannot have any remains for. But there are things that were quite solid, like boats and uh, tools, um, that were made with material that doesn't remain. And specifically when using grasses and reeds and things like that, you don't have any remains of it. So we don't have any remains at all of, of the very early boats and ships. We know the Sumerians were trading, and Iraq doesn't have any copper. Iraq doesn't, uh, Mesopotamia doesn't have these metals. It had to come from elsewhere. And one of the sources we know was from Oman. And you had to bring that with ships. And they found the, 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 they found the, the source of the copper that came from Oman to Mesopotamia. And they, they found also the port uh, that this copper was being shipped. And we have cuneiform evidence of how much shipping was coming, but we have nothing about the boats except for fragments of these boats, which are basically clumps of tar that have imprinted on one side um, uh, the, the imprint of, of basket, of a basket, of a mat, and on the other side, they, uh, the barnacles and, and sea mollusks that prove that this was the skin or the covering of boats. Mm -hmm. And when they made uh, analysis of it, they, one of the sources for these tar was heat. Uh, and I had seen um, uh, just one or two archival photographs of a type of boat um, called Esbie, uh, that. Um, used to come from, from heat, and I went to, to discover more about it and see if there was an you know, experiment with, with uh, making this boat. Because so far, 
every trial attempt, and there have been a couple to recreate the Sumerian boats, have all failed. They have sunk, you know, three days and they, and they have sunk. So we still don't know how they built those Sumerian boats. Um, and uh, all these, these different boats that I was making, each one has some clues and some ideas. These are intangible things. I mean, how, you know, how, how to discover something that you have no evidence mm -hmm. of. Uh, so I've always thought that this Esbia boat of, of heat had some clues in it to how they would have built it. Uh, luckily, when I went to Heat, we found um, uh, an old man, uh, uh, Haji Na'man, uh, uh, Hamdi Na'man, who, who was the last person to have built it with his father, this kind of boat. Uh, so we, we have been recreating this SBA and has a very particular uh, technique of building. And these boats, uh, this SB, and they call it also Kaya, used to take the, the tar from heat down all the way to the south of Iraq. And, it, and they all one way. So they, they built the, this boat in a bit like a, a, a box. Uh, and what's specific about it is that uh, it's, it's, it's built on a platform and then straight down and it's connected the side of it with sticks. And it's what's called in architecture wattle and daub, which means you make a structure. Uh, uh, so I mean, to, to retrace the, the, the coracle is a, is, a, is a coil basket. So one, one coil. Uh, and uh, the, the kaya, the esbia, it's a wattle and daub, so that you make a, a, a platform and then you make the sides, and the sides are connected, tied. There's no metal or no wood is used. It's just with sticks. And then you have uh, bundles that are, are put in, and everything is then tarred. Um, uh, and um, yeah, so then they fill it with, with the tar and take it down river one way, because you've got a, a river moving very quickly and uh, uh, you can't bring it back up. So at the end of it, they sell the tar and then they, they break down the, the spear. Um, the number of boats that are one-way boats, the, the, cor the, the um, uh, rafts are the same thing. The, anyway, so uh, I, that I've been doing. Now, the, the, the thing is that uh, we're working uh, in, in, in the situation where all these different boats have disappeared. So the Kaya or the Sibia, we're, we're recreating it for the sake of the knowledge. There's no point in recreating it as a business you know, or anything. It's just to understand what it is and doing that. Uh, the Mishhuf, the canoes, no, there's the possibilities of using that in, in, in tourism. And also we're looking at how to, how to keep it alive by uh, uh, promoting the idea of a national sport you know, with these boats. If you go to all these countries that have a boat tradition, you've got sporting boats, and, and if they have a, a interesting boats that are uh, like the dragon boats of Asia, you know, etc., you, you can get traditional boats doing So we want to see how to keep them going. Mm -hmm. uh, the coracles as well can be used both for sport as well as for, for tourism, etc. So we're doing that as well as looking and surveying the rest of the crafts and uh, uh, what, what their situation is and how we can, we can uh, return their development. Because when, it, when you look at, at cultural heritage and intangibles and, and uh, the crafts, it's not only a matter of the past, but it's also a matter of the future. Many of the things that, uh, that have been lost have been lost because of they've been taken over by plastics, for example. So, a solutions to our abuse of plastics and our pollution is also might be in these traditions. Um, that's, that's on one side. Also, how to uh, work. People need work, and, and especially in the rural areas. And that, that work can be provided by, by these, these crafts. Uh, so we're looking how to, how to reinvigorate, revitalize this and how to also create some kind of a dialogue 
you know, and, and a, a conversation with the rest of the world. So uh, in our plans, we're looking to take these Meshuf canoes and take them to the rivers of the world to bring them out with an exhibition, with material, and see these beautiful boats on, on the river. So you have Mesopotamia, Pont Thames, uh, what's the lake over here called, what's the, the water over here called, you know, in, in Stockholm, you can imagine these boats over here. Huh? Esterkan. Esterkan, on the Esterkan then. Uh, and also we're, we're looking at making, we've been actually commissioned to do the Iraqi pavilion for Venice uh, Biennale, for the architectural Biennale with the concept of, of the arc. So it's, it's, it's working inside, but it's also trying to see how to create bridges with the outside. And, and just as within the country there's been a, 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 some kind of separation or alienation between society and, 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 and the environment, uh, there's also been a disconnection between uh, uh, you know, Iraq and, and this land and its diaspora. So we want to see how to use this culture as a means of re-engaging with Iraqis who have left the country so that they can maybe you know, either come back or re-engage because we need to have some kind of a continuity. Uh, there's been a brain drain, there's been also a drain of, of youth. Uh, a lot of, of things have, have, have left that uh, could reconnect. Uh, and Iraq as well has come through 40 years of war um, you know, that has uh, hurt, hurt our, you know, has hurt a lot uh, both the country and the image of the country. So by doing this we hope to also open up the country and, and hopefully with, with few years of peace uh, have, have people sort of returning and, and, and re-engaging with this very, very beautiful country. Mm. Yeah, so uh, cultural heritage, intangibles, well, very tangible reality. Mm. Mm.